often say of my friend Eddie that there, if there truly is such a thing as saints or angels alive walking among us, he is one. The work that the staff of the South Texas Human Rights Center deals with is literal life and death. One project of the center is to place water barrels along the barren and in inhospitable land on this side of the Rio Grande. The barrels must be continually replaced as they are often and quickly destroyed, poisoned, or stolen. In the event that a migrant loses their life, the center attempts to locate and identify the remains as well as see that they're returned to loved ones. He has done this work for more than a decade. Please give a warm welcome to my friend, Eddie Canales. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was just, you know, explaining to Christy, you know, yesterday I was out there on um, Highway 77 coming out of, you know, it comes out of the valley. And we have stations out there. And I had some journalists that came in. I mean, they're they're actually uh, co contract or freelance journalists, but they were covering the the center's work, um, and it's for a company or a media company based in Germany, but it's a Russian company, in, which was the most interesting thing that uh, I encountered yesterday. But I took them there. I took them there. We started off. You know, coming back towards from Fontaurias to um, Rivera and turn, and, and then he was he was running out of battery, and I said, "Well, let's go straight to the one that I wanted to show you." Um, we had had some volunteers had uh, at service that route 77 out of out of uh, Brownsville, <clears throat> and they you know they reported to me, Eddie, there's a camera there. Um, there's a camera there, and, and you can see the havoc and a little bit of chaos has happened when, when people, you know, come and get water, and the camera is spying on them, the surveillance on them. And of course, um, you know, that's, it is, um, that's a tragic in the sense that all we're doing is providing water. Uh, for people that are attempting um, attempting to come here and um, uh, making the journey, and I, you, um, I'll use this this term, the journey of faith. Uh, a friend of mine, a Reverend uh, Baptist uh, minister preacher that teaches over there at the um, Presbyterian Theological School in Austin. Uh, he frequents down in the valley and makes uh, and talks to children, talks to fam you know family members that have come through, and and re requests from them if they want to express their journey in a in a sketch, a little painting, and in in uh, however, and the, the whole project is called Lagrimas de um, Arte de Lagrimas. Art of Tears. Anyway, um, I've been organizing for many years uh, in a sense that I'm Eddie Canales, he, him, el. Um, I've been doing this work for many years and kind of uh, incubated by my grandmother, Mama Panchita. You know, um, activist, always constantly moving, a faithful, I mean, a very deeply faithful uh, in prayer woman. I think she did a rosary in the morning, a rosary at noon, and a rosary in the evening, praying every single day. And <clears throat> so um, I, I was born here, and, you know, there is um, a question, you know, the, the, the title here is uh, dreamers, and I'm going to make some comments about the dreamers of, in terms of it does completely express or signify 
that this country cannot move to accept people that have lived here for a long time and no other life. You know, they were brought here by their parents. Um, many of them 10, 15, 20 years and then and over the and by executive order Barack Obama did that um, in terms of creating the dreamers temporary protected status if you applied for it. So that we've got a, a kind of a million people in limbo um, in that regards. I mean, they're, um, it's kind of, you know, stale there because this country is polarized, extremely polarized in terms of the, uh, any type of solution regarding uh, immigration, you know, and I don't know how, how how much knowledge you have of immigration, how much, you know, in that regards, but I mean, there is uh, certainly a lot of uh, misinformation. And uh, that, that seems to be the, the, um, the name of the game right now, misinformation, in terms of, 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 of scapegoating, stigmatizing, dehumanizing, and the and the, the only thing it's really is criminalizing criminalizing people for being irregular and i'm going to use that term irregular uh, because they cross the border without inspection that makes somebody irregular does it make and i, I was explaining to um, a um, intern that had come in to uh, the center before cultural anthropologists out of California. She's doing her dissertation out of uh, Texas A&M. And we're talking a little bit in terms of, there's only, really only one approach in terms of how we're dealing with immigration. And that's an enforcement approach. Um, there was very good comments that were done here regarding the question of <clears throat> Texas and you know the, the colonization of Texas, and I, <clears throat> I often I, there's a, a tremendous amount of people that come through the center, and you know whether young and old and you know mixed and everything, but you know interfaith groups and everything. Sometimes I close with understanding how does the colonizer treat the colonized in the historical context. And um, so I, um, you know, the, the whole question of, of the, the, um, you know, the immigration policy just being an enforcement only approach and nothing else. There's the militarization in terms of the checkpoints, that's epitomizing. It epitomizes what we're meaning in terms of, of um, control, and in, in terms of control, in terms of, you know, and that border, that checkpoint right there that is 80, 85 miles from the, that's one, including the one on Sarita, the, including the one on 281, there's over 120 checkpoints all up and down the U.S.-Mexico border. So an enforcement-only approach, and I was explaining to that young woman about, you know, the, the how do we, how, because I've been asked many times, many times, okay, well, what's your, Eddie, what, how do you solve this? You know, what's your solution? Well, at this, we have to look at it in, of course, racial basis, or restore, you know, the racial history of immigration policy is there in terms of keeping keeping the um, population, certain populations out of, you know, being very restrictive in terms of who you keep, keep keeping out. Political asylum issues started with World War II where it has not evolved to any degree in terms of what this country, in terms of keeping the Jewish population out of, the, out of this country during the Holocaust. There was a complete rejection of, um, historical rejection of, of in this in this country 
of that flight of those people leaving. Um, so I'm going to say, say uh, here's the, the question in terms of the dreamers. They're, in, they're captive, they're in limbo, but there's leadership there. Leadership that is present and, and seeking freedom, seeking and there's, <clears throat> I was looking through this, you know, one of your songbooks here, and <clears throat> and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, singing the journey. And freedom will come, and freedom will come, and freedom will come, and that's the general terms of the song. You know, so the fight by the leadership of, of, of people that are dreamers, that are DACA, uh, as the legal term it refers to, well, it's not going to end until there's freedom and justice. <clears throat> I did a small little, uh, a little film one time. Uh, I was approached uh, um, by a filmmaker coming out of <clears throat> very, of all places, a, a liberal community in Oxford, Mississippi. <laughs> but he, he, you know, that is a little con conclave there in terms of you know, in Mississippi, believe it or not, but there, um, <clears throat> he came to a little, do a little film about a gentleman that started at the El Paso border and was walking it all the way to the Boca, Ch Boca Chica, which is Boca Chica is um, Brownsville, the very tip. Guess what's at Boca Chica now, by the way? Spacex, uh? exactly. Uh, I went, <clears throat> I went there. You know, the other, we did a tour the other day, and right, <clears throat> right after one of the rockets had disintegrated, <laughs> and <clears throat> it is, <clears throat> in a very sense, very amazing in terms of how they, how they build rockets, because you can see clearly how rocket rockets are are built there. So <clears throat> anyway, at the end of that film, you know, um, and I. I closed that film, and, and it's very, in terms of saying, immigration policy right now, it's people coming across, and I was explaining to the young woman about, we have, we have the jobs right here. The jobs are here. Jobs that nobody wants to do. And you talked about Mariano. Mariano is a perfect example, you know, of a job being done by somebody that nobody else wants to do. And then you have people over there on that side of the border waiting to do those jobs. They want to do those jobs. And that's all. That's all. I mean, that's how simple it is in terms of the, the life, the pursuit, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have that in, our, in the Constitution in terms of who does that apply to. So <clears throat> I'm going to say that we have, the jobs are here, the workers are there, and, and we can pursue a policy that makes those workers, instead of being irregular, regularize. And that's all it is. It's not rocket science. <clears throat> the political will, <clears throat> the political will and the desire you know, and the solution and in and, and terms of, and we are faced in this historical, there is a crux in this country right now <clears throat> in terms of where, how we pivot, how we move forward and being a society that this church professes to establish in terms of the, uh, the compassion, the will, acceptance of people. So, there's no tolerance on, on the right whatsoever. And we have to deal with that reality. So there's a, there's a little uh, um, poem here that, um, or a, a, a song here, and people move under the cover of darkness. Yesterday when I was putting water out there, it was 113. I had a, I had a cap on. But when we got to the station where there was a camera spotting, use, utilizing, and, and you know how hunting takes place. You know, I don't know if anybody goes hunting. 
And it's no longer a game. It's no longer actually a sport because you put food out and you wait for the deer to come and then you shoot them. There's not, that's not a process. That's not the way my grandfather used to do it. He used the stock and carefully go through the woods and quietly try to find game. Whether, whether it's rabbit, whether it's snake, whether it's deer, you know, a little, little town right there on the little piece of land that's there on the border, uh, right there in Stark County. So um, let me just say here, uh, um, I was going to read it in Spanish, but it's here in English. It says, De noche que iremos, de noche que para encontrar las fuentes solo se um, nos... Lumbra, lumbra solo la se no, los numbra. So it's basically by night we have, it, we, we hasten in darkness to search for the living water. Only our thirst leads us onward. Only our thirst leads us onward. A, it, I, I brought the little book, uh, We're Water Protectors, and it was so beautiful the way you, you guys incorporated it in, into, into our, our day here and our service here. So um, there's a little PowerPoint out there. We're, we're, there it is. Okay. So um, briefly, you know, the center has been around since 2013. Um, and um, the, next, the next one we're established right there. Our mission is to and migrant deaths. And when I say have somebody go to the port of entry, identify themselves, present their identification papers, you do background checks on somebody that's not coming in, that's got a criminal background. The person pays a bond, a non-prohibited bond of less than, you know, than a thousand dollars, place that bond at the border and that person, and that person gets some temporary social security card, work permits, and that person is regularized. He's regularized. The, he, she regularized, and the person enters the labor market. The wage dictates, you know, the market will dictate what the wage is, what the work is, and the center was involved in creating a global compact for migration. And that global compact, UN stuff, states, nation states, determining that migration is something that is not going to stop tomorrow or the next day or in, in, a, in, a, in a decade. Migration is going to continue. So you have to create those processes in a multinational basis to create safe, orderly and regular migration. And that is all that system is to manage migration. It's not giving people a status, resident status, it's regularizing a worker so that worker does not become exploitable, vulnerable, and at the mercy of this corporate country that we're living in. And so, um, we do have we, we do have the whole question of trying to end migrant deaths through our water stations. I had ten water stations stolen from ten seventeen three weeks ago. We had two volunteers that come in from here, one from the valley, one from Corpus. They know what they're doing. I have all the routes on GPS locations of going through there and, and report back. Ten of the water stations were, were taken down. They've been there over eight years. What permeates is hate, and we have to overcome that. And we know the policies, and I kind of refer to the, you know, the, the policies of this governor in this country as Abbott's atrocities. Really, what's going on in this country, in this state, right here? I, I think it's difficult for you guys. You can put up a U.S. flag because that's what this country is all about in terms of having life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But Texas, Abbott, 
those are atrocities, concertina wine, buoys, throwing people in prison without any process, throwing the guard down there without any, 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 any uh, sense of their families or anything like that. It's just the continued uh, per perpetuating how the colonizer is treating the colonized. And there's a, I put out a little story yesterday or a couple of days ago in terms of a baby being passed through the concertina wire. And babies dying. Um, the most important thing, one of the most important things that we've been doing, of course, is the, the whole question of, of um, it's all about the families, serving families, and we do have a hotline. We manage a hotline where we take calls from people from all over the country, all over the, the Central America, South America, you know, we've gotten calls from Europe and, and, and everything in terms of once they cross the border, what happens? They disappear. They go in and, you know, people, <clears throat> it's el desierto, the desert. Well, I mean, the, 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 the vegetation in South Texas is monte, is chaparral, it's treacherous, it's mean. It's thorny, it is, it is hot and humid. Mm. And that's what makes it a desert, I believe, in terms of the heat. I mean, 113 yesterday. Um, so um, most important thing, of course, is you know, having access information for the families. And <clears throat> we provide that. I think uh, uh, last month, over 223 calls and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the same. Even though Brooks County or this sector over here, and we go by sectors in terms of Rio Grande sector and then the Laredo sector and then the, the Rio sector and then the, those are border, border patrol terms. And <clears throat> I have to work with border patrol. I don't have a choice. They, ha they have their apparatus, their assets all over the border. They have stations all over the border. And for us to be able to save somebody, and we're in Fanfuras to save somebody off of GPS coordinates, they have to act. And uh, in terms of rescue, we, we do some of our searches uh, to some degree in, in Brooks County, but it's not, there's no resources. We, you know, we're a, a human rights center that's providing, you know, the trying to prevent people from dying and trying to provide you know information to the families and then also the more critical part on the forensic end the very forensic in terms of the investigations the recovery the the um, uh, identification process and the and the repatriation to families so it's you know we'll continue we'll continue that effort right now we i mean we started in Brooks County is, a, in a way, it's a template, it's a model, uh, because we evolved to, because the center, the South Texas Human Rights Center, asked Border Patrol to come to the table and for, for us to figure out how to process r calls from people in terms of where their family member was. Number one, we needed to know whether that person was in detention, pre-COVID pre-COVID, and, and that was a relief for families. Oh, he's, you know, we would find out he's in he's detention, no longer missing, no longer desaparecido, that person is safe. After COVID, Title 42, complete expulsion almost immediately, no due process, nothing whatsoever in terms of people being, being pushed back. Under, under Title 42 and the zero tolerance that was put in place by Trump and Sessions in terms of the separation of, of families. Let me just say this. The separation of families is not a new thing. It's been going on forever. And in the cities in terms of ICE raids on families and, 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 and the, more, the more frustrating and the more heartbreaking thing for me regarding somebody being deported because of their mere presence in the United States. Mere presence. That's it. 
You had no other crime. You worked. You raised your family for 10, 15 years. You have a home. Kept no, no crime whatsoever, no charges. And then you get caught. You get stopped. You have a, a faulty taillight. You've been here 15, 20 years, and you're mere present. You're gone. You're separated from the family. So the p policies, it's all enforcement in that regard. So I'm going to, I think I'm getting ready here to close, but, um, you know, um, for the forensic aspect of it, quickly, in terms of us developing in the model in Brooks County with a portable morgue, and the only reason we defaulted to that is because the missing migrants program that we developed with Border Patrol created those processes in terms of really trying to do some, some um, re rescues and recoveries. But at the end of the day, it was also identifying people. And guess what? We, the, the system of perfecting people through fingerprints, it has been developed over the last 2021, we're in the last two or three years, and it, it has really, really helped families because it expedites and creates closure for people to claim the bodies through the fingerprint process. You, you identify people through fingerprinting, you identify people through uh, dental records and DNA. And DNA, you know, is being, it's a long process, expensive process, and, and but but it, we are getting better. Those protocols are getting better, and we need to continue our efforts to establish an, a human rights forensic identification center. S South Texas has no medical examiner system. It, nothing. All those all those counties: Star County, Jim Hogg County, Brooks County, Willacy County, Cameron County, Hidalgo County. No ME system. So it all falls on the justice of the peace for them to go and to go to the scene and to kind of declare who, you know, but, and they, I mean, it's not a medical examination. It's not just to say, oh, at the time of death, the elements, the person died because of the elements. I'm going to, um, I'm going to say that um, the most important thing, of, of course, is, you know, the fact that we can regularize people. We are, uh, you know, we're next next week, next Sunday. I'm gonna or next Saturday. I'm gonna give a talk at the Mexican American Studies Symposium here. But it is a question of <clears throat> irregular migration, how we deal with that, and develop policies that are coherent. Migrate, migrant sm smuggling. If we create regular regularized processes, then we get rid of the cartel an organized crime doing all the smuggling, making billions and billions and billions of dollars because of the policy that creates them, our state policy. U.S. government that says prevention by deterrence, I'll close by saying people will continue to move all over this world and there is no deterrence in terms of people of uh, stopping people from moving. There's internal migration in this country. And you, I just kind of was trying to help a friend last night <clears throat> get regularized because they moved from one state to another. And they had to change everything. You got to change your address. You got to change your, you know, register your car. You got to do, you know, if you're going to, you're going to, uh, you're a voter, you're going to do all of that. That's a sense of, you know, kind of a process of regularization. But we're not, when you regularize somebody, you put that person in the workforce and you, down the street, you go down the street, everybody's hiring. Everybody's hiring. I'm going to, and if we create some coherence to the policy, we'll create some, we can create some principles and guidelines for, of human rights at the, at the border, at the international borders. All over, all over this world, but especially as how we're dealing with immigration right now in this country, move it away from some, the, the whole enforcement aspect of it and, and building the wall and people dying in the river and, and, and that there, 
death has value. I mean, that, that people have value. They have a right to live. And dignity in the process of coming to work and be a producing human being that doesn't exist in their own country in terms of the economic conditions. Thank you very much. <laughs>